This program is being presented to you by the Heraeus International Winter School on Gravity and Light. Welcome to the problem class of the WE Heraeus International Winter School on Gravity and Light. Today with our 10th problem sheet about symmetries. We as always start with the first exercise, true or false. Which statements about push forward and pull back are correct? The push forward maps a vector field to a vector field. This statement is not correct. Therefore, I have to remind you on the definition of the push forward. First of all, we have a manifold M with a map phi to N. This map only has to be smooth. No injectivity and nothing else is said about that. These are our both manifolds. Now we take a point P and around that the tangent space, TPM. And we take another point, Q, and the tangent space over there. Now it could be that the map phi maps the point Q and P to the same point in the manifold N. Since the push forward is a map from TM to TN, we always get with, and this map is defined with respect to this map, we always get the tangent vector in TN. But the idea of a vector field is that we have at each point of the manifold, to draw it again, this is now n, and these are the tangent vectors, uh, the tangent space is over there, we always have just one vector in each tangent vector space. But with this construction we had two points in one of these tension spaces. Therefore, it's not a vector field. Therefore, the first answer is incorrect. The pullback of a covector, covector yields a covector. I remind you on the definition of this. We can again have this picture, but the pullback maps from T star N to T star M. And this is certainly true since every element in T star N lies especially in one T phi pi N and maps it to one T star pi M. Therefore, it maps a covector to a covector. This answer is correct. One can induce a metric on a smoothly embedded manifold by pulling the metric back from the ambient manifold. This is correct and I'll show you why. We just define it in the lectures. We just say that the pullback of a metric evaluated on some vector fields is defined as the following. It's G of the push forward of the vectors and this defines the pullback of the metric. Therefore, this statement is also true. The pullback. I should clarify what an embedding is first. So, an embedding is a map, is an injective map from a manifold to another manifold and embedding we just denote by this curved arrow. This have to be smooth, then it's a smooth, and injective, then it's a smooth embedding. If we have this, we always can find such a map, and this is always fulfilled. The next question asks us about are the push forward and the pull back linear maps? Yes, they are, that's correct. And I show you a part of the proof 
here. We again have the map 5 from say m to n and we now want to see how this works. So let act the push forward on a sum of two vectors. After that this lies in t, p, t phi of p n so we have to act on a function f which is an element of c infinity n. For this construction we need that x and y are element of the same tension space. Otherwise this addition is not well defined. For that we use the definition. It's x plus y of f after phi. But now this is again the, uh, the addition on the TPM. But since TPM is a vector space we know that it's defined pointwise in this sense. And after that we can again apply the definition of the push forward, what is phi star x of f plus phi star y of f. We can now again pull out the f And what we see that it is linear. The same trick we can do for if we um, multiply with a constant out of R, we will see that it works the same way. Therefore, the push forward is linear and we can also do the same calculation for the pullback. And therefore, in shorthand, the push forward and the pullback are both linear maps in this sense. The push forward is a 1, 1 tensor. This is incorrect since a 1, 1 tensor is a map from T star M cross T M into the reals in a multilinear fashion. This is not the definition of a push forward. One can only pull back a 1, 1 tensor along a bijective map. This is incorrect. One can actually pull back any tensor along a bijective map. Therefore, the answer is incorrect. B. Which statements are correct? A Lie subalgebra L is a symmetry of a metric tensor field G if the pullback of G along the flow of any element of L reproduces G. First, we clarify the vector field. Okay, we have, if we have a vector field, x, which looks like that, then it has integral, integral curves. That means that there exist curves in the manifold, which point P, where the vectors of the curve at this point coincide with the vectors of the vector field at this point. That's it. And now we can ask, or we can, we, we can look whether if we start here and go with the, <coughs> with the um, integral curve gamma p, just a small parameter value lambda, we come to this point, and at that point the tangent vector of this curve should also agree with the tangent of the vector field. Okay, that's it. And if we, we can do this for all points in the manifold, here, or P's, and we come after a small step lambda always to another point here. And all these maps we denote it by H with respect to X, the vector field, with the respect to the parameter lambda, is a map from M to M in a smooth fashion. This we call the flow map. Since this is a smooth map between two manifolds, we can push forward or pull back some tensor field, some tensors along this curve. So if we now do h x lambda pull back 
of some metric and this yields again the metric. That means if we start here and see ah here's the metric attached and we go back some steps and see ah the metric has the same, it looks totally the same, then we know the vector field X is a symmetry of the metric G. And if this holds for all vector fields out of the Lie subalgebra, then we call the Lie subalgebra a symmetry of the met metric tensor field G. This statement is correct. The Lie derivative of a vector field y with respect to a vector field x is the commutator xy. We just recall the second axiom of the Lie derivative lxy and it was defined as x, y with the commutator. So this statement is true. A Lie subalgebra L is a symmetry of a metric tensor field if the Lie derivative of G with respect to every x element L vanishes. Therefore, we just have to repeat how the Lie derivative was defined. We can define Lx of some G is defined as the limit lambda against zero Hx lambda star of g minus g divided with lambda, uh, through lambda. Ah, but from the first question we know already that this is equal to this, so the nominator is a zero, therefore this is a zero. Ah, therefore if the Lie derivative with respect to x of g is zero, Therefore, it means <coughs> that L is a symmetry of the metric. This statement is also correct. The Lie derivative acts on a function as the covariant derivative does. This is simply the first axiom of the Lie derivative. It says Lxf equals to x of f. And this is the same as the covariant derivative. Therefore, this statement is also correct and we finished the first exercise. Exercise 2. Pull back and push forward. Formula for practical men and women. Question. Consider a smooth map phi from m to n between two differentiable manifolds. Show that for function f element c infinity n the pullback of the gradient of f is the same as the gradient of the pullback of f. That means exactly this. Yeah. In order to show that, we choose an x element tpm, which, on which we act with the whole guy here. Since phi star df is an element of tp star m, we can act on a tpm and get a real number. Let's do that. As first step, we just apply the definition of the pullback. It is the vector, uh, the covector field acting on the push forward of the vector field. First definition. Second definition, we just use the definition of the gradient. That is, phi push forward of x, what is again an element of tpn, what can act on a function c infinity n. This is this guy. As a next step, <coughs> we use the definition of the push forward. This is defined as x after f of phi. Now we have to think a little bit in order to get exactly this form. We can ask ourselves what is the push forward of a function, uh, what is the pullback of a function. Therefore I will draw a short picture mn phi and we have here the function f into r. We can ask now, what, what we already know is if we pull back 
in this way, covector fields, we again get a covector field over m. What we now consider is that if we pull back a function on m, we want to get back a function on m. This is the only thing we can get out of this structure. This is the map f after phi. Yeah, and to write this in a pullback fashion, we write it down as the pullback of the function f. Okay. With this thoughts done, we can insert this in here, and now it's written x after phi star of f, and we now go some steps backwards. We know that this can also be written with the definition of the gradient as d of the function phi star after f, what is in all a function on c infinity m, acting on the vector x. x. Therefore, as we th see, since we did this all for an arbitrary vector x, we can conclude that this is equivalent to phi star df equals to d phi star f. This is exactly what we have to show. Question 2. The push forward from Tm to Tn is a linear map between tangent bundles. Calculate its components function. Okay, so in order to do that, we just apply this thing. We just calculate some steps and see that the result of that is very important to derive this formula. Phi star a b equals to d y a acting on phi star del after del x b. Okay, we first apply the definition of the gradient again. That's the vector phi star of del after del x b. What lies in T n acting acting on y a, where y a is a function on n, since y a are the charts on n. And we just can <coughs> use the definition of the push forward again. That means it's the vector field d after dxb acting on y a after phi. This is all what we want to do at this step. Question. Show that the component functions of the pullback phi star g of a metric tensor field are obtained from the component functions of g by the following expression. Therefore, we just have to calculate a little bit and use the result of question 2. So, let's start. Phi star g a b evaluated at p in the x chart is defined as the following. It's phi star g of yeah, the, com the basis and I'm not allowed to forget the brackets here because we have to evaluate at p. But as we have seen before, as we know from the lectures, that the pull back of the metric is the push forward, is the metric evaluated at the push forward of its arguments. Therefore, next definition, g of phi star acting on del after del x a evaluated at p, comma, phi star del after del x b evaluated p bracket close so after this we simply can expand our g again
we can expand the vectors inside the chi in some basis. We call this basis y. It's chi of First we need the components of a vector, del of del x a evaluated at p, the mth component times the basis vector evaluated at p, comma, phi star, oh, surely not at pi, it's a phi of pi, since after we do the push forward we go from m to n and the bases are then in phi pi. It's phi star of del after del x b evaluated at p. There from the nth component of del after del y n evaluated at phi after pi. Big bracket close. Since we know that G is a linear map, we just can pull out the coefficient functions here and the coefficient functions here. So let's do that. It's phi star of del del x a evaluated at p, the mth component, times phi star of del after del x b evaluated at p. From that the nth component times g of del after del y m evaluated at phi of pi, comma, del after del y n evaluated at phi of pi. This guy here is just g m n evaluated at phi of pi in the y chart. And the first guy and the second guy as well, we just have to see how this two relations are come together. We know that if we want if we like to figure out the components of a vector and these are the components of a vector we have to act on the vector itself with the dual basis. Therefore we can write this expression as del y m acting on phi star of del after del x a evaluated p bracket close bracket close and this is exactly this guy. Ah, but this we already calculated and we see that's just del after del x b x y of phi with this index combination. We just have to re look for the right index combination and write it down. After seeing that this is exactly what we calculate in question 2 over here, we just can plug in these guys and for these guys we can plug in this. So. What is written here is del after del x a evaluate at p of y after phi from this the nth component times del after del x b evaluated at p and from that uh, y after phi the nth component. From behind we have this, that's g m n in the yth chart phi of pi. And comparing to what is written here, 
we see that this is true. Therefore, this exercise is complete. We now come to exercise 3, lead derivative, the pedestrian way. The lead derivative is a tool for investigating symmetries. Question. Consider the smooth embedding J as a map from S2 to R3 of S2 equipped with a topology in the atlas, so a smooth manifold, and the same for R3. Which for familiar spherical chart U, X element A and R3, Y is the identity map on R3 is given by the following expression. Where A and B are positive real numbers, what can you say about the shape of J of S2? That's a good question. What is a shape? First of all, I would say it is necessary to can talk about straight lines or something like this. But as we already found out, in order to do that, we, it's not enough to have a bare smooth manifold. We need extra structure. There are, we, we just know, in this course, we just know two extra structures. It's on the one hand side a connection, which yields something like that, or on the other hand side it's a metric. But since we do not have anything like this defined on this smooth manifold R3, O standard and B, we could not talk about the shape. Therefore, what can you say about the shape of J of S2? The answer is nothing. Question 2. Now assume that R3 O standard B is additionally equipped with the Euclidean metric G, whose component functions with respect to the chart R3Y are given by this expression. Write down the component functions of G ellipsoid, which is defined by the pullback of G with respect to the transmission function J with respect to the chart U of X. Okay. How does this work? We just have to simply recall the formula of the last exercise, of exercise 2. Therefore, we found out that the pullback, the components of the pullback of a metric are just defined as the following. This is just the definition again, evaluated at some point, and just the component functions. But the formula we found out was that this is equivalent to del of y, I should write, write down in a similar way as before, del after del xa evaluated at p of y of j, the mth component, times del after del xb evaluated at p of y of j, the nth, compo nth component, multiplied with g m n of i of p. Uh, not i, sorry, j, j of p. Okay. But this symbols, we can simply expand a little bit more. We know that this symbol just translate the first one, as the partial derivative with respect to the eighth component of y of j of x inverse of x of p from that the nth component. The second derivative is del b of y of j of x inverse the nth component of x of p times g m n j of p. But let's have a quick look at j of p. We know, ah, this is just in the manifold R3. So at this 
point something is going wrong since this p over here is not the same p as here. I'm sorry, it's just confusing. I'm very, very sorry. All this p I call just p twiddle. Here all p's go to p twiddle. And all the p twiddles are element of S2. So our yotta maps our elements of S2 into <coughs> R3 in the, in the sense that I of p twiddle is equal to pi. Therefore, we can use here, it's just a pi, just correct it here, it's gmn of pi, and therefore we can use the concrete expression of the G in the ambient space. Okay, that's the first step. In order to now really calculate how all the components of G ellipsoid look like, we just have to calculate. A and B are running in this case from 1 to 2. So, 1, 2. Okay, we just plug in. I write it down one time a little bit a little bit more and then I just talk about what I'm doing here. It's the mth component derived with respect to the first component of y of j of x inverse of x of pi del 1 y of j of x inverse the nth component I can immediately write it in here of x of p tilde times g m n p. So what I see first is if m is not equal to n, all these terms vanish. So we have to just do y equals 1, equals 1, equals 2, equals 2, equals 3, equals 3. That means we get here three terms, but all terms are quadratic of one of these both because these are the same since the derivatives are the same here. Okay, look at the first term. Ah, and the good thing is that this expression is given here. So we can now just derive, if we derive with respect to the first components, we just derive with respect to theta. And if we derive with respect to the second component, we just uh, derive with respect of phi. Okay, let's do that. And the first thing, it yields a squared cosine squared phi times cosine squared theta, theta, theta plus b squared times sine squared of phi times cosine squared of theta times c squared of sine squared of theta. But in this expression, since a, b and c are not the same, in principle we cannot go any further. The same calculation holds now for g ellipsoid 1, 2 of p tilde. And after a short calculation, you will find out that it's the same as a squared cosine phi cosine theta times with a minus sine phi sine theta plus b squared sine phi cosine theta times sine theta cosine phi. Since we know that a metric has to be symmetric, we also know that this is the same as g21 ellipsoid p tilde. If you don't believe me, calculate it again and you will see it will yield the same. g ellipsoid 22 yields after short calculation a squared sine squared phi sine squared theta plus b 
plus b squared cosine squared phi sine square theta. That is all we are asked to do in this question. But what we see here is it's very interesting. If we have given a Euclidean metric on the R3, we can construct from there, given <coughs> an embedding map which embeds the S2 into the S3, we can pull back the metric from the whole R3. That's the idea of this exercise. And you see the formulas are not very short, but OK, and it's really easy to calculate. Question. For convenience, denote by theta and phi the coordinate functions x1 and x2. Check that the vector field given here constitute a least subalgebra of gamma ts squared with the Lie bracket and determine its stru structure constant. What is a least subalgebra? A least subalgebra can be paraphr paraphrased that if we take two objects out of the Lie algebra, taking the Lie derivative of it, should yield a linear combination of the Lie algebra components, where the C, K, H, A are just some factors. If we have checked this, we can be sure that all axioms which has to be satisfied from Lie algebra are satisfied. And while this calculation, we also get the structure constants. We start with the first bracket. We just take x1, x3, evaluate at some point, then we have a vector. And if we have a vector, we can act with it on a function f. And this we just do in order to do not forget any terms. Afterwards, we will see that the function f pull out here, here's something written, and all the equation holds just for the x1, comma x3. Okay, let's start. It's x after x3 of p on f minus x3 after x1 at p of f. This is equal to x1 after x3. Now, x3 is easy. x1 is just this guy. It's minus sine of phi del after del theta minus cotangent theta cosine phi del del phi acting on del after del phi. After that we evaluate all this at p and act on a function f. Minus or the guy the other way around. Del del phi acting on minus minus we pick two times a minus make a plus here sine phi del after del theta minus cotangent theta cosine phi del after del phi after acting with a vector field on a vector field we evaluate at a point and act on a function f So what is what is happening here? First, the first derivative acts on this function, and after that, we act with the other two derivatives on the function, which comes out if we act with derivatives on a function. That means what is written here is minus sine del after del theta del del phi of p f minus cotangent theta cosine phi del del phi del del phi 
of f. And we also have to evaluate all these points since we already do the evaluation on p. And over here, I forgot a phi. Sine phi of p of p of p. And I will suppress the p's from now on. Okay. Second term, here we have to be a little bit more carefully since we act with a derivative on a product of functions, sine phi del del phi on f, it's a product, and it acts on both. So it's first the derivative of sine phi with respect to phi is just cosine phi del del theta of f plus sine phi del square del phi del theta on f minus, first derive the cosine, and I did again a minus, minus sign mistake since I said here I bring the minus out and forgot it in this term. I'm sorry. So again, del del phi on this guy, if you derive cosine, take the derivative of cosine, it's cotangent theta sine phi del del phi on f plus cotangent theta cosine phi del square del phi phi <coughs> on f. What one sees now is that del del phi f with this guy has the same components in front, though this kicks out with this. What we also see is that this guy and this guy are the same with another sign, so this kicks out. The only two terms which are still there are these two guys. That's cosine phi del del phi f minus cotangent theta sine phi del del phi on f. And what I mentioned before is we act with both objects. We act with both things on f so we can bring out the f. And what is written there is exactly the sky, the x2 term. So what we get in the end this is equivalent to x1, x3 are equal to 1 times x2 and the structure coefficient function is a 1. You can now do the same calculation for all remaining pairs and with the C it works out very well. This is a take home exercise for you. The next question. Calculate the integral curve of x3 through the point p equal to inverse of x, uh, equal to x inverse of theta naught phi naught. That means the curve gamma p satisfying, uh, so an integral curve has to satisfy gamma p of zero is p. That means for the value lambda is zero, we start at the point p, and that the tangent of the curve gamma p at some point gamma p of lambda is the same as the vector field x3 evaluated at gamma p of lambda. That means that pointwise the tangent vector of the curve and the vector field share the same vector components. Okay, just shortly repeat what we mean by <coughs> uh, an interior curve or a curve in general in a chart. It's just x after lambda, x after gamma from lambda. After explaining to you how a curve looks in a chart, 
I will write out these two expressions again. It's just x gamma prime, the eth comp component times del xi. This is the left hand side. From the right hand side, I know this is also just the sum over this guys and I write this more precisely in our fashion it's since we know x1 is theta and x2 is phi it's just phi uh, theta sorry after gamma prime times del del theta plus phi gamma prime del del phi is equal to the x3 component, the vector field x3 at this point. And the vector field is given by del after del phi. Ah, what we can immediately read off is that this guy has to be 0 and this guy has to be 1. Prime. And I didn't. I just suppress that I evaluate at lambda, sorry, of lambda equals to zero and phi of gamma of lambda is equal to one. But this is not asked now. We want to calculate this guy. In order to get this, we have to integrate this. Okay, the integration for one dimensional problem is very easy, especially if the right hand side is a zero. So what we get is a theta after gamma of lambda is some constant. But we now, I just do first the both integrations. On the this side it's nearly as simple. It's just phi after gamma of lambda it's 1 times lambda plus another constant c prime. But since we now have the boundary conditions <coughs> that yeah, gamma pi of 0 is pi, we have to plug in this. So give me a, a quick thinking about that. We know that pi is x inverse of theta naught phi naught. So theta after gamma naught, we know from that that this is just theta naught. And from phi times gamma zero we know lambda is taken to zero so this is just phi naught therefore we get that c is theta naught and the tilde is phi naught it's phi naught and phi after gamma of lambda is equal to lambda plus phi naught. Therefore we have calculated the integral curve gamma p in a chart x. Question. The integral curves gamma p give rise to a one parameter family of smooth maps h x3 lambda from s2 to s2. Calculate the pullback H x3 lambda star G ellipsoid of the metric on S2. What can you conclude for the lead derivative L x3 of G? First of all, let us think about what this map is doing. Therefore, we choose a chart. X after H x3 lambda after x inverse is a map from R2 to R2 in the following sense. We plug in just a theta and a phi and what we 
genau das, Theta Phi plus Lambda. If you like to draw a picture of the sphere embedded in S, S3, this is S2, with the equator somehow here, then the vector fields X3 are just these lines here to the equator, then one line here, and so on and so on. It's just cyclic. And what our our map does is just if you start at this point, say, after some parameter lambda, we just change the phi of you know uh, with respect to this parameter lambda. So we run around the equator or other lines here. Okay, this is the idea. And yeah. And what can you conclude for the lead derivative L with respect to X3 of G, where G is mean the G ellipsoid, means if this would be equal to the G ellipsoid again, then the metric would look the same all on all lines along the equator or parallel lines to that. Okay. In order to check this, we have to calculate a little bit. Therefore, we have to calculate the pullback H X3 lambda of G ellipsoid. But this we just want to calculate the components of that. And therefore, we have to evaluate in S2. And S2 we get if you take the inverse map, x inverse of theta phi. So, first step is again, use the result of exercise 2. How <coughs> a metric pulls back under some flow. It is just del del x a of x after h x 3 lambda, I forgot to evaluate this at the point, there from this we have the mth component, exactly, and our point P is again like here x inverse of theta of phi times del after del x b x after h x 3 lambda, the nth component, the derivative evaluated at x minus theta phi, times g m a of h x 3 lambda at the point p, what is in our case x 1 inverse theta phi. Okay, we now can, can look closer at this expression for a second and what we see is that it's exactly the derivative of this with respect to the eighth comp with respect to the a entry and the mth component. But what we see here is if we derive the first component with respect to something else then the one-th component we get a zero and we only get a one if we derive with respect to theta with the first component. For the second term the same argument holds if here is a 2 and here is a 2. So in total we can write this guy here in matrix representation as 0, 1, pardon, 1, 0, 0, 1, A, M and this guy we also can write 1, 0, 0, 1, M, B, G, M, N, H, X, 3, Lambda, X, inverse of Theta, Phi. Okay, after that we see that this is just a delta, so we can just rename M and N by A and B.
a b. Now we come back to the question and I always forgot here to write down it's le whether these two things are the same. And what we see now is since this guy here gives us in chart representation nearly the same just again of a theta and a phi but with an offset in the second term. Only if the offset I don't want to confuse you, I just calculate this by inserting this and compare it with GABLE evaluated on theta phi. This, this would be the most easy thing because we already calculate this. I do it just for one component, so calculate this for one component. It's G11 LE of HX3 lambda of X inverse of theta phi. And this we calculate, I think, one exercise before, or in the same ex I think in the same exercise. There we already calculated the pullback. <coughs> of this map. Exactly. And this was just a squared of cosine phi, but then now it's not cosine phi, it's cosine phi plus lambda, here square again, times cosine square theta plus B squared sine squared phi plus lambda plus co sorry times cosine squared theta plus c squared times sine squared theta. This is what we calculate now. That's the pullback with respect that the pullback of the G ellipsoid with respect to this flow map. And what we had, if we do not pull back with respect to this flow map, just the pullback of the Euclidean metric with respect to the S2, we found out that these are almost the same, just with some different expressions. Instead of phi plus lambda, we have just phi. That's all the difference, what we found out here. And I here forgot the term, term. It's cosine square phi, uh, theta, here. Comparing these two expressions, we see if A is equal to B, here just written A squared times cosine squared of theta and here just written a times a squared times cosine squared theta. Aha! That means if a and b is the same then the pullback of the G ellipsoid along the HX3 lambda curve is again the G ellipsoid. This also holds for all the other components of G. This means if you have just an ellipsoid instead of a, this is an ellipsoid and this is a, a sphere and this is our angle phi, that means if you just deform in this direction then this map is again, then the x3 is a symmetry of the metric. And this is the idea of this exercise to see that under which circumstances vector fields are symmetries. This concludes this exercise and see you in the next time.